My name is Sam Tramsky, and I'll be moderating the event today along with my colleagues from Agenda Propia, Dilma Prada Cespedes, um, an Indigenous journalist and communicator, Diana Manso. This webinar has been organized by the Earth Journalism Network, which is a program of the global media development organization, Internews. The Earth Journalism Network, or EJN for short, has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism around the environment. And it does this by helping journalists around the world report on climate change, biodiversity and conservation, pollution, and other issues by providing story grants, training fellowships, and other kinds of support. EJN is also a community of more than 15,000 journalists in about 180 countries currently. You have all registered as a result of participating in this course. As members, you'll be the first to hear about story grants, fellowships, and events like this webinar. Our joint EJN Agenda Propia Red Tejiendo Historias bilingual e-learning course, Indigenous Journalism, Environment and Territory, has been wildly successful thanks to you. It is made up of three modules that introduce learners to the fundamentals behind what is Indigenous journalism and why it should be understood apart from traditional news media. What kinds of environmental concerns are most directly related to Indigenous people, specifically in terms of human and territorial rights, and what kinds of storytelling can be used to better tell environmental stories with and about Indigenous people. If you have finished it, you know there are quizzes and exercises throughout the course that are meant to help you demonstrate what you have learned and hopefully provide skills for your own stories about Indigenous environmental themes. And there is a certificate at the end once you have completed all the material. Following presentations from our speakers, we'll be opening it up to the audience for questions. For those of you who are watching this live, if, you're, if there's something that you'd like to ask any of the speakers, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom at the bottom of your screen not the chat box. We will be monitoring the Q&A feature, but we will not be monitoring the chat. So please only put questions in the Q&A. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to rewatch or catch any parts you missed on our website in the next few days. And attendees will receive an email so that they can watch it later. Without further ado, we're going to turn it over to our first speakers, Edilma Prada Cespedes and Diana Mans with potential support from Natalia Salman. They will explain Agenda Propia's and Rede Tejiendo's Historia's method known as intercultural journalism, which they have utilized in collaboration with indigenous people throughout Latin America. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Adilma and Tiet. Thanks, Sam, for this invitation and this exercise. And the conclusion of this course for Indigenous journalists. My name is Adilma Prado. I'm a journalist. I live in Colombia. And I'm going to be here helping out with this seminar. And I would like to say hello to our collaborator, Diana Manso. She's Mexican. She's one of the journalists, most recognized journalists in Mexico. Welcome. Hello, Adilma. Thank you to all of you for inviting me. I feel very happy. I'm a Zapotec uh, reporter from the south of Mexico in the state of Oaxaca. That's where I'm from. We've shared lots of stories, which is what we're going to talk about today, how this project got started. And it's a wonderful project. And even though we didn't know each other, we we're able to pull it off in the middle of the pandemic. And there's a lot of story to be told about how it all got started. Even though we haven't really uh, met each other in person. And it's not just about me as an in indigenous, indigenous journalist but along with your help, we're able to uh, do a nice project and get and do a good job on this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Diana. Um, she's always going to be um, uh, Diana Salamanca is also going or oh, Natalia Salamanca is also going to be uh, participating in this session. Just real quick to say hello. And just to remind everyone that 49 people voted um, who participated in this course, who speak Spanish, voted on the name of this uh, seminar. 
and also those who speak English. And uh, that's why we decided that that's why we decided that the theme would be on the context and the method. We'd like to say hello to all of you who are participating in the course. The idea of this course was to give a lot of different thoughts and tools to be to make better stories that have to do with indigenous peoples. Especially with um, IJN, there's a particular focus on Mother Earth and indigenous rights. The idea is to make an effort um, to tell stories about territories and rights. And we're going to get started uh, with Diana, uh, her thoughts about the course. Diana, what are your thoughts about the course in, in general? But especially about original peoples and indigenous peoples, original communities and indigenous peoples. One second, I'm going to share my screen. I think you can see it now. So I'd like to start uh, to start talking with Diana about these reflections, and this has to do with um, getting into historical context, social context, geography, with regard to origin and territory of original peoples. Diana is an indigenous journalist, and we've spoken a lot about uh, in journalist journalism. There seems to be a lack or absence of context when it comes to indigenous peoples. Their stories are told without explaining to people what is the orig origin of the people, what is the social context, why are they fighting for certain rights? And please explain why it's so important to put this into context when we tell the stories of indigenous peoples. I think it's important to get to the root of the matter, the heart of the matter. Who are the people in the story? Where did that community come from? How was it founded? I understand that a lot of times when we're so busy, we're in our day-to-day -day routine, it's easy to leave those facts out, that background. But our readers deserve that. Our audience deserves to know, especially because many journalists aren't from the communities and they get there and they're like, well, why are they fighting for a little piece of territory or a river or for that mountain? If it's just a few bushes there, so what's the big deal? But it's important to understand their ancestral point of view. The leaders, the grandparents, the older people in the community. Or to interact with local journalists who can give us that vision and help us understand those geographical and social contexts of each of the different peoples. Because when we read the article, if we don't have that context, we judge them without really understanding all the facts that have to do with their territory, with where they live. So it's important to point that out. And I think it's important for the whole story to have the context, no matter how short it is, uh, and especially the ones we did in the, our own agenda here. It's, muy val it's very valuable to uh, give a critical viewpoint to discuss these matters. I remember when we were working on that, how uh, journalists from other communities would give their opinion on that and they would say we cannot forget why it's so important to defend that river to go back a little bit and understand why that community is defending that river that's very important it's something very basic to not 
leave that out because that contextual memory um, is like a starting point for us to um, give a balanced and well thought out story for our audiences because that long time struggle it's important for um, our audiences to understand that and where it's coming from thank you diana let's go with the second reflection here understand the cosmovisions of each of each uh, people to understand new issues with territory and to tell the story with dignity and balance about their struggle for the, their rights to be respected and there's there of their lands there's in latin america there's over 800 different types uh, different indigenous peoples and 800 ways to tell their story So there's a lot of differences, um, leadership structures, languages. So with you and the Zapotec people, how does that work? And why is it important to uh, distinguish between each indigenous people? Okay. When we're talking about um, rural populations, when we're talking about technical peoples, uh, black peoples but when we're talking about indigenous peoples we're talking about 800 different indigenous peoples in in the american continents um of course there's many more around the world but we're just talking about latin america so let's talk about this thought and why should this uh cosmovision be important So we have to go back to the root. And besides our grandparents, culture is very important. We must always maintain our identity because it must not be lost. And these are topics in education that we ourselves have standardized. We have standardized it with the Mucha community, for instance. The Mucha community, we call them the community of sexual diversity. They're not even trans. They do not identify as trans people. They are muches people. So the fact that we view this uh, in this way, I see many muches coming uh, around my house and everything is standardized and normal. But when I started talking about their territorial problems, well, we have to broach this topic with dignity and it's not just the people going out on the street to defend themselves or defend their own struggles, but they also do it to defend their languages, their culture. So we have to go back and look at this sector without criticizing. And that is a very important topic in my community. Imagine, we have to supplement the voice of Amuche for the defense of water and the defense of land and territory. It's not just men and women, we have to include them as well. So this would give us a different vision when uh, creating a balance, and especially at the time of a broaching uh, topic from the journalistic point of view. So as I said before, we have to take these issues into account and also how to keep balance in all of this because perhaps we're very radical sometimes in our struggles. We say we're not gonna permit this and that. And so we think it's very important to observe and question and ask. Let's say for instance, if we are fighting against a wind farm, there are many wind farms and wind parks in my vicinity. So we have to balance that information and we have to listen to the people who are just going by, are just passing by and have uh, nothing to do with the land. And we ask them, what is your opinion? So then we start finding other things that will be included in our stories. And we must not forget as well, 
the issue of mentioning companies, mentioning the authorities, what's happening with this claim uh, for human rights and territoriality. So as Zapotecas in particular, that's what we do. We want to set our sight very uh, fixedly on our grandparents. And that is very important for us within our work. Thank you, Diana. This reflection leads us to the last and final key to write stories for indigenous populations. The diversity of voices within the different civilizations. You talked about the grandparents, the grandmothers, the grandfathers, and that diversity of voices in rural communities. I wanted to emphasize the context. Many stories in indigenous populations, the headlines, we always talk about indigenous communities living far away in a jungle or very set aside communities in the mountains far away. And we forget that there are many indigenous people who are in the cities, who work in the cities, who have studied, who have become professional and they offer lots of services. And there is an organizational uh, structure in each city. For instance, in Colombia, there are many town halls for indigenous people due to forced displacement issues and people who came with the armed conflict and uh, to offer them uh, opportunities for work and to study. So there's a plurality of voices and uh, that's a marvelous basis for a story, whether it's uh, indigenous or not, for diversity. And I want to continue with this reflection. We also have carried out several analyses as to how to include the indigenous peoples with the official voice, that's uh, the government's voice or the uh, authority or the police department or the military of armed forces, but not the voice of the community itself of the indigenous people. So we think that these official voices and the stories of the indigenous people should be the voices of them, of the communities and also as I said before, uh, a matter of dignity and uh, respect. We have to add other sources. We cannot continue to talk about the stories of indigenous populations without these other histories of all these others, climate changes, territoriality. So this is fundamental for the Population, uh, indigenous populations voice be the official voice. What do you think about this, Diana? Well, what we have done on our side, we have asked women to talk in their different uh, strikes and struggles. I remember when I started in journalism in 2005, I always saw women in the kitchen making food and so on and so forth, and the men were offering the conferences. And one day I got into the kitchen and I asked for their permission. Of course, whenever you work with indigenous population, you must always ask for permission. And uh, when we sow and when we uh, plant the crops, we always ask permission to Mother Earth and say, thank you for this space. Thank you for this crop. Thank you for the rain. So uh, we also have to ask for permission. So I asked permission. And I said, may I come into the kitchen? There were about 20 women, each one doing one part of the meal. And I said, well, what do you think about these struggles? And one of them said, well, fancy that. Somebody remembered that we exist and now we can talk. Well, of course they can talk because they're the ones who listen the most when things are being discussed, but they're not allowed to have an opinion. So I believe that that is also important to go to those small little corners and touch their shoulders and say, look, even if they're cutting up the chicken or the fruit or the vegetables, talk and feel, what do you feel about this strife or struggle? And that uh, enriches all the stories and narrate them and put them in context is also fundamental. I spoke to such and such person from a kitchen close to the fire and that makes them feel more empowered because then the voice is not just to tell the girl who's next to her, oh, look, this and that, that's what I think. No, now their voice is expanded and that provides important opening for them. Of course, this doesn't mean that women just because they're in the kitchen are not defending their rights. Of course they do. But I believe that that is very important not to forget about this. 
Yes, what you mentioned is very valuable. Of course, based on your experience, you are giving us journalists for in this session key aspects to listen to other voices and to take what they think. In practice, I have walked through various indigenous communities and I take advantage of the dialogues where there are differences and I do collective interviews, also community town hall meetings are spaces for collective learning. And for instance, the YU people invited the journalists, they said, come here, come to the hammock, come sit in the hammock and let's talk. The hammock, the chinchorro in Spanish is a hammock, and the Wayu people who are in the Kalemen Wajiro to the far north is an ancestral territory between Kalemen and Venezuela, and there are very traditional practices day to day so that we can collect information and hear their experiences. And each people in their territory has their own way of being with the Amazon people, the Andean people, the people who are in the forest. Their experiences are varied and different. And I think that we must collect the voices of everybody. That's fundamental. Um, we would like you to understand a little bit more about the method. This is the method that was uh, created through the pre-selection has to do with intercultural collaborative journalism. And in this exercise, we propose several words. It's a work method with a circle of work. It starts with the word circles, which are conversations with leaders of those communities to define a topic and to produce a history, a story. Then the journalists create an agenda with dialogues, then we open up to data. If there are no official data, we gather the data in the indigenous communities. Then we hear the diversity of voices. We talked about this already. Then we go to number five, which is to walk through the territory. We have to go through the indigenous populations and communities and the peripheries where the communities are located. Then we have to do an intercultural edition with the indigenous populations and this is a very interesting exercise which are collaborative narratives we gather together the interdisciplinary teams and the visualizers and the designers and the illustrators and then the entire process is completed with a participative uh, dissemination and that means that the story is taken back to the origin and in all of this cycle of course, we can take some time creating a journalistic uh, uh, series that could last six to eight months. We talked with Diana. Diana participated in an exercise that is called Outlook on Territories, Resist to Heal. And this is the exercise that we proposed for you in the course for you to understand the work method a little bit. And I would like you please to tell a story. So now I'm going to show you a video for illustrating purposes, and then we can start a dialogue with Diana about this uh, outlook on territories. In a second, I'm going to go to YouTube. OK, here we are. Twenty five tales from eight indigenous peoples in five countries. Narrate climate crisis and offer solutions to resist and heal. Mexico, Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica, Colombia. Learn about this journalistic series and outlook on uh, territories. So now Let's talk about this outlook on territories to heal. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to show the work later on. Diana, how was this created, this outlook on territories series? Well, as I said before, it was during the pandemic. I remember when I saw the call, I had read it, I had looked at it, but I didn't participate with you. 
on this topic. So, well, anyway, I signed up. I decided to propose a subject matter, and I'm very happy to be part of this. I knew it's going to be very intercultural because not any editorial house or any group of journalists can do this task. I mean, sometimes they cover the topic and then they say, okay, you handle it, and they do not do follow up, as you mentioned. They do not accompany us. And this is very important. I celebrate it. I hope everybody could do it like that. And so the idea is to meet the world circulation, which had me in the first place to how to approach this topic with the female experts. I remember they would talk about it and they said, look, you have to listen to the communities, you have to go, you have to be involved. And that's where I started discovering how to approach this topic. Finally, my own was called Migrants of Rain. Priscilla Hernandez was my editor, and she is a great editor of Agenda Propia. And uh, even though she's not from an indigenous community, she has that intercultural outlook, which is extremely important to have. And she told me, do you know, let's see how we're going to talk about the migrants related to the Zapoteca culture. So what I did, I started interviewing indigenous migrants or immigrants. And we do not usually view their outlook in my area. Every day, hundreds of migrants pass through, but I never have that particular issue of talking to them because do you speak an indigenous language? So this outlook of finding that, and after doing this job, now I have become a different person, a different journalist after finding this different outlook. And that's why I am extremely thankful to you because right now my reporting abilities are different. Now I ask them all the time and sometimes they are very scared. They don't like to talk. They are fearful of discrimination and racism and being pointed out. So I remember Pedro, he was one of the people I interviewed. He didn't want to say anything. He didn't even want to talk. So little by little, I earned his trust. I met him three or four times. He's an adult person, he's 60 years old, and he's migrating to another territory. So imagine an adult person. We talk about these. We hardly ever talk about these issues. Uh, people who are 60 years old and now they are migrating. Well, there must have been an extreme reason for him to leave his uh, community. He had to go somewhere else. He was a migrant. He was an adult person. He was an indigenous. So he had three major disadvantages against him. And he did it because of the climate changes. And that's another complicated situation that the indigenous people are suffering, the displacement. He was displaced because all his crops were lost due to the hurricanes in Honduras. So. We have to start finding and start talking to them in a very respectful way. So it's not about making fun of them because you're from an indigenous company or a community. Journalists need to be sensitive to give them their space, their time, not force anything. Because a lot of times what do we do as journalists? We want to get everything we need in just one hour, get home and start working. But that's just not how it works. Stories deserve their time. They, things need to be done gently. I think I had to go travel four to five times to little by little asking him, Pedro, what were you uh, farming? So, so what happened here? And who else is getting here? And there were people from other communities. We have to see where they're from, from the Gar Garifunas indigenous co uh, communities. Why are they immigrating? What's happening to them? And then we went later, um, starting, we then we started to get the text together with data because we found out there, there really isn't any data on uh, the migration of indigenous peoples. So we started getting these data, this data together ourselves, interviewing leaders from those communities they would actually give me the an interview without even knowing me. So that's why I respect uh, that work that we did, and I really appreciate it. Because people that don't even know you, they give you an interview, they say, oh, she's a Mexican reporter, and they trust you. They, they take your word for it. 
and they give me contacts, finding new people to interview. And little by little, we started getting this project together. And so we start, we talked to an older person and she was a, she was a woman. Edilma. And she didn't just come out and say that she was from an indigenous community. She was embarrassed to say it, to tell me that she comes from an indigenous community. All she wanted to say is I'm Honduran and that's it. But it's important to, uh, to get them talking, to help them feel confident. And then little by little, she started telling us, look, I come from here. I'm coming with my daughters. And how we got the Zapotex in here. <laughs> I celebrate that with Pris because she's the one that gave me that intercultural um, point of view because the Zapotecs were people from of the clouds, were also immigrants. We came um, from the va central valleys of Oaxaca, five hours away. So that bond, that immigrants that come from Honduras, it's basically a migrating Zapotec person. And it helped me to have even more respect for immigrants. To understand that in reality, we're all immigrants. And that we just basically want uh, a house, a place to sow our crops. But at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm, I'm an immigrant. Um, there was illustrating the story, uh, giving it a new incentive, a new angle, maybe not just 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 about Pedro. When we went to the shelter uh, on the way that Alejandro, Padre Alejandro created for immigrants. And a lot of people who are immigrating get there where they can receive help and assistance support. And that's where we ask them if they're from an indigenous community or not. We could take pictures of them there. We ask them for permission to share their stories and to show uh, the, this design with like a isthmus feel. It's a very colorful place here, the isthmus. There's a lot of flowers and colors and textiles, fabrics. But uh, May is the happy month. And so even though we've struggled a lot, we like to communicate with all those colors. And we did a comic. Uh, to tell the story of the immigrating indigenous peoples. But we also uh, gave it our isthmus touch. Because uh, this is, that's what we wanted to show in this story that, in that story, that it's part of us, that we can relate to their struggle. And it was well received. We put a title in Zapotec and in Spanish. But I think each one of these stories needs to be appreciated. And also the historical context, what we talked about in the beginning, who they were, why they're suffering from floods and climate change. What happened there? What made them decide to migrate? We had to basically explain all of those different background stories. And in the end, it was basically a story about immigrants, but that context was important to, to point out. And it's important to understand that we can tell these stories from an intercultural viewpoint. Edilma, Priscilla in Guadalajara, Edilma in Colombia. <laughs> we didn't know each other. It was just through messages that we were talking, but we had a common understanding and we were able to do things in an orderly and clear way. How we're going to include pictures, how we're going to narrate them, what's going to be the caption for the pictures, how to do it in an intercultural way, in, in a collaborative way. And all of that, it requires passion and compromise because it takes a lot of time and responsibility. It's when you uh, commit to do a job like this, 
you want your work to come out good to this story you're reporting with passion to come out well so you have to be com committed to it when you start the reporting or the pre-reporting all the way up to the publication how am i going to share it in my social network there's got to be a method for that to share it to get it out there because a lot of time as a reporter you know however they want to do it do it just publish it but that's not how it is and this is something that's reaffirming indigenous peoples and they're all around us they're your friends you're your neighbors so i think it was a, a journalistic project uh, from an indigenous point of view it's a collaborative project and two or three people we didn't even know each other in person and but we were all committed we were all locked in and i think that's the challenge that's uh, being met at ahenda propia i think the storms disconnected adilma so i'm going to uh, we did a replace placement of her of her screen and thank you for pointing out what you said diana it's true it's not just something we do on our own it's something that we have to do as a team collaborating together even despite all the challenges which aren't minor uh, you explained what it means to do uh this collaborative kind of work just over screens and video conferences in uh, agenda propia those of us who are here indigenous communicators and all throughout the whole region and we're all doing our part to uh take advantage of all these systems to carry out that step-by-step -step process that you explained so well in this collaborative type of work so our time is up now and now the idea is to open it up to questions and answers so I'm going to share this screen here, um, the materials that Ahenda Propia has, and also the participants in the course. We invite them to just download this and analyze it. And, and if there's any kind of feedback you want to give um, for the organizers of the course, we appreciate it. You can use this form, fill it out online. Everyone is invited to, to use the tools that we have here at your disposition. And uh, what you see here, it's um, this section I was just showing you is found in the Mochila de Saberda section of Agenda Propia's website. That Mochila de Saberda is the knowledge backpack. Uh, there's a lot of co-creation exercises there. And we've created tools from, from this project uh, that help our journalists to keep moving ahead with their work. And there's uh, voices of women, voices of keepers of knowledge, how to work on indigenous topics with data. And all of that is included in the course. There's a QR code there too. And uh, there's a bunch of different features there that you can see. We know there's a question and answer um, feature there on Zoom. I've seen some comments so far. And salute us a lot of uh, greetings. So we have two questions here that we can um, that we can ask. I think Tatiana's was already answered, and Natal and Anna's as well. Maybe we could 
answer Anna's question. So Natalia, of course, it's more of a comment than a question, but <laughs> basically what you've said, thank you so much for sharing what you have with us, Diana. It's very inspiring to hear you. And it's true. It's very inspiring. Very well explained. This method of intercultural journalism is very innovative and very different from what most journalists are using in their jobs. But I have a question. So I got a question when in, in terms of the progress of this type of method, like environmental journalism, for example. How can we share more of this method, get it out there more? Get it integrated into our job, into our work, it, add it to our work that we do. Maybe using social networks, social media, or how can we how can we promote this and get this involved? How can we get it out there using this method and around the world? What do you what's your opinion on that? Are you asking me the question regarding dissemination? Yes, is that related to the question that Anna wrote? I was able to read the question. I would like Diana and collectively to answer the question because Diana mentioned something very nice. She talked about the kitchen, right? When she started in journalism in 2005, women were in one place and men were in another place. I would only say that participative dissemination is fundamental so long as it reminds all of us as communicators that we have to go back to the territory to share what we did this is a habit that us as journalists do not have we believe that we go to a location we get what we need and then we say goodbye and uh, see you again ne never so that has also generated lots of harm in the communities because some people are very tired of working with journalists that never say what they do with all the information that they have collected so as a method it is a way of collaborating with the communities let's say it's a way to protect for these problems that happen for the communities to know what is happening while the story is in production and then we guarantee that we go back to the story whether it's a communicator who goes back or she or he do photo exhibitions or video projections in the communities and we also create alliances because going back to the community sometimes is very costly so we share materials with one person in the community and that person is in charge of disseminating the information and i would say that that's a way of honoring the trust that was deposited in the teams of communicators to narrate stories of the territories and uh, sowing what came out already for it to become available to the people so they can do whatever they want. For instance, Mochila de Saperes has a superpower, quote unquote, because they have all the materials that can be downloaded. People can take it with them. If there's no connection to the internet, they can show it, they can print it. So we don't only depend on internet for that. So that's what I would like to say. And I would like Diana to add to this. Thank you, Sandra and Natalia. I believe that within the editorials, uh, we have to have indigenous journalists because that's my mission. I want to write stories with the communities, but we never ask, how do we get to those communities? So they have to take us into account as well, because we are of these communities and we can say, okay, shall we approach the topic in this way? Shall we come to another person with a different indigenous language? I can be your translator. Because as you said, people are tired. As you said, what are we gonna talk about? Well, it's a bit of an international struggle for the defense. 
for instance, in Mexico, the corridor of the Maya people that are migrating. I'm not the only journalist who has gone to see them. There have been many journalists who have gone to talk to them. So the person, if it's the same person, the people get tired of talking to the same journalist. So I have to tell them, I want to introduce myself. I am very respectful. Respect is always very important. People deserve this respect. And you must tell them, look, I'm going to publish what you tell me. I'm going to publish some photos. I'm going to share and be in constant communication with you about the story. So from the start, when my department is sending me to do this job, we have to start there because we have a different vision as to how to approach these topics and not viewing um, information as exploitation. And we've been working a lot in this issue because it's as if you say, look, you're taking what I know, my knowledge. And if you go and you take away the knowledge, you take away the information, but we mustn't exploit the information. The information has to be told. The words have to be told, but it's important to get there and change the mind frame and the vision as to how to report for the indigenous communities. And the communities, well, we are not special people. We are not extraterrestrials. We must not differentiate one from the other. We are human beings. You are human beings. You are offering some information and you have to respect their ideologies, their ancestral beliefs, their own stories. Nobody can take that away from them, even if you're a journalist or not. So we have to have that idea. As a indigenous community, they have their context, they have their language, they have their identity, and we have to keep that in mind and we have to go and approach them in that way. And that's when we're going to get a good story, but always based on respect. Thank you so much. Sam, we have two more questions. Sonalama and Teodora are mentioning them in English, but Diana said something and it connects with Diana's question, which is the last question. So let me round out and then we shall answer the other question that has to do with territorial rights. And Diana can talk about that if, if it's agreeable with you, Sam. Shall we do it that way? Because Theodore is asking for something that Diana already mentioned. How can digital media incorporate the ways for the communities, indigenous communities and indigenous narrators to tell their stories. What are the challenges and what are the risks? And Diana was talking about incorporating indigenous journalists to the uh, departments of the major media. So I believe that the challenge first, the, the challenge for us to work together is to work one beside the other, not feel that we are different, but to generate places where we can get to know one another, where we can talk with one another, where we can share what we've been doing. And well, a verb that I love to talk about is co-creating. So it's to get together, to meet up. When we see the other person, um, I, we usually say, well, are they useful to me for such and such way? But that's no use as an indigenous communicator and as a person experienced working in these media, I think that it would be more advantageous for the ladies who work in Agenda Propia and in this network of uh, weaving stories that we have to get to know one another. We have to understand the way of each person of viewing the world. We walk each one in their own path and then we have to meet in the middle. We each have their way of working. We each have a way of viewing the world. We have to work together. And this is a different or difficult process, right, Diana? Because sometimes we talk about processes and people think that it's quite easy, but it's not. It's quite difficult and it takes a lot of time. And I believe that many of these co-creation processes change people, change me. We have to see how we view the world in a different way after this. Diana was talking about the Zapotecas and the migration of people. She says, well, we come from the clouds. Well, wow, 
when you hear that people who are non-indigenous we do not view the world in that way we don't see it that way but i believe that those of us who work in intercultural communication would love to learn about all of this the way of viewing the world in a different way and to narrate it and so that's how i would supplement that question by theodora i would say the fundamental way for us to have intercultural journalism is to create spaces for encounters and not based on the need of I need you to do my job, but on, based on an interest of getting to know one another and jointly see what can be co-created. So that's all I wanted to say. Yes, and also break the myths that we cannot work together. As you said before, it's a hard uh, task. I discovered something valuable you have in Agenda Propia, and I hope that other publishers would do it. It's the new dialogues. We have discussion tables, the actual word, discussion table, let's have a dialogue before we go to, out to work. That helps us a lot to say who you are, where you come from, what do you want? And so I can say, well, this is my profile and I can work with that. And so the word circles or word circulation is very important. Yes. Sam, would you like to answer the next question? There's a question by Sonam Lama. She's asking about the legal instruments. I'm going to explain it in English. Cuando los derechos territoriales de las personas indígenas son violadas, también tiene un impacto sobre la extinción de la cultura y el, el lenguaje. Estos instrumentos legales proporcionan algún tipo de inmunidad, pero ¿cómo piensa usted que los IP deben luchar para salvaguardar sus derechos en los países que firman documentos legales, pero no los ponen en práctica? So, when indigenous people's territorial rights are violated, it also has an impact on the extension of their culture and language. The legal instruments provide some sort of immunity, right? Because they are protected within the state. And how do you think, based on the experience of your people, how can the indigenous communities fight to safeguard those rights in countries that sign legal documents but do not protect them? Or quote unquote protect them but don't implement them? So how can these indigenous communities fight to safeguard their culture and their language? Thank you. In Mexico, there is a law on free determination. People can decide if they want to have a project or not. But of course, the government imposes certain projects. But we have the ASCASUR agreement to protect environmental rights. So there are mechanisms of protections for advocacy members and journalists. Mexico has become a lethal government, but specifically talking about the Zapoteca people. What has been a, a very useful to us and what I can highlight when I'm going to cover a, a journalistic note is uh, education. As people, they know about the laws. And we have to break those myths, as Irma said. The Zapoteca people or the Uchitana, we are 120,000 people. They have banks, we have an airport. We have many transnational stores as well. So what I want to arrive at is the organization has the fundamental element to create a position. If we're not organized, we cannot do this. So we have to talk about that as well. Not just say, oh, poor people, all the indigenous people are far away and they're being subjected to this and that. Well, fortunately, these uh, populations have indigenous anthropologists, they have sociologists, they have attorneys, they have lawyers. So we have to search for those uh, actors, for those players to talk and to accompany us. In the past, they would never get in meddled in these strikes and struggles. They would never participate. But no interview was uh, being conducted on them either. So what I think is important is that obviously most of the laws in Mexico, well, there are many great laws like the Convention 6069, which is the International Labor Convention, which uh, 
gives a respect to free determination of the indigenous people. All of this is very pretty on paper, but not in the reality. So we have to cover those issues as well. And how do we cover these issues? Well, we just have to show, showcase what's happening in the Zapoteca community. There are laws, there are amendments that sometimes we do not know about. And we have to highlight the minimum resistance. We cannot, as journalists, judge them. We cannot say, oh, it's only 10 people and 10 people want to defend a mega project of a transnational wind company from Spain. Well, it doesn't matter. We have to cover that issue. It's not just thinking, oh, these people, these transnational companies are so powerful and we cannot uh, fight. No, this is not to do with the numbers. We have to look at our organization. How do we organize ourselves? If we are only three or five members, it's the journalists are going to cover that issue and what's going on. Why are we five people organized defending a river or a forest? So rather than judging, or saying, well, uh, is this valid, this strife or not? We just have to cover the news and we have to seek more voices because the laws are there. The laws in Mexico are for all indigenous communities, not just for the Zapotecas or for the Guava or the Osote. It encompasses all of them. So journalists must learn about these laws and read a little bit and get to know and ask so that we can uh, know what we're going to do when we publish these stories. So those laws are included when they publish their stories. I just wanted to add one thing, Sam. There were several tools in the course, but there are two that were introduced uh, about indigenous peoples that are really important. And I think we need to know that really important that we know the agreement 169 convention 169 about indigenous and tribal peoples in, in the independent countries it's there in the course but there's two articles there in that convention that we really need to pay attention to one of them is the right to territory it's not just about um, the physical land where they're living, but their cosmovision. It's very important that we know about Convention 169 and that article about territorial rights. And there's another one that's newer. And then there's a new one um, that most countries have signed with the UN and, act, and uh, updated a convention. And when they clarified that, the most important thing that they clarified when it comes to indigenous rights is that fact that indigenous peoples are humans. They're human beings because a lot in a, in a lot of countries, uh, there was legislation. They were treated as second class citizens or savages or not even as people. But these changes started to these laws started to change very recently just in the 90s in colombia for example so they've been changing little by little and i think it's important for us to understand the legal frameworks um, their names and what they accomplish uh, a little while ago in colombia it was okay to In a lot of legislation, the names of the indigenous peoples were changed. But now there's legal frameworks that are established. And we need to take a look at that. This is a, a recent struggle of indigenous communities, but not of peoples, because it's been something going on for a while. We need to know what rights they have, how we put them in context, the, the rights when it comes to territory, cosmovision, languages, which we've been talking about in this conversation with Diana. And we need to include all of that to uh, give a, a, a good story that gets all the facts straight. 
and we need to also be respectful of the diversity that exists in, in this context. I'd like to just add that. So we're getting to the end of the seminar. Thank you all. Um, I think the next step would be would be to complete the course if you haven't done so yet. I think our emails are available. And also um, Twitter, Instagram, our social media handles and accounts. But we're going to continue this uh, conversation, this discussion in another way. Maybe not in this webinar, but but using other channels. It was such a pleasure to share this time with you all. This method and all the different features of this course of Agenda Propria and Tejendo Historias. Um, journal Indigenous journalists like you, Diana, thank you so much to all of you for being here. Thank you for giving me that chance and thank you as well and for this wonderful conversation. It, Sorry. And there's also a survey at the end about this webinar. If you'd like to fill it out, that would be a, a huge, a huge help for us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.